All right, well, welcome everyone to our weekly Wednesday webinar series, Foundation Insulation with Stonewall. This course is approved for one hour in continuing education units, as well as AIA, health, welfare, and safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Um, my name is uh, uh, Brett Little, and I am the program manager here at the nonprofit the uh, Green Home Institute. Um, the Green Home Institute has a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the places we live. Um, and some of the lessons we're going to be going over today is, uh, you know, how to use uh, this type of insulation stonewall uh, within the foundation and under the ground, um, which is kind of new. It's been around for a long time, but kind of a new idea that we don't see too often that there are alternative strategies. Um, besides your traditional um, rigid foam insulation that can work, and how does it fit in with LEED? Um, before we get there, we do need to thank our top tier sponsor, um, Reem, uh, who makes ducted uh, or ductless uh, air source heat pump uh, systems for water heating. Um, so we can actually heat our, uh, uh, our, our water with the air, believe it or not. Um, super efficient um, compared to both standard electric or gas electric uh, or gas systems. Um, uh, different settings on those, warranties up to 10 years, water leak detection, and can work with home automation systems. The new Proterra, you can see how these systems work at the top. They've got a vent and it brings in warm air. Uh, even cold air in the wintertime is warm. It has heat in it brings it in through a, a compressor, uses a, a refrigerant to absorb the heat, the compressor pumps the heat through a condenser, the heat is transferred to the water in the tank, and a condent the condensate uh, is routed away from the unit. These again can be ducted in certain applications like a garage or a basement, um, and they can be uh, strung together for like multifamily or commercial settings where you need a lot of water heating. Again, you've got smart technology that works with your phone. I have one of these, I use it, it works great. I'm tracking my energy, operations, leak detection, um, changing the temperature, changing the setting, are you gonna be away? Time of use programs are coming. And the cool thing with this program, what you can do is you can set it, you can see you've got your, uh, your peak usage there, your hot water heat, uh, heating it up during the day before the peak electric loads. And then from two to seven or wherever your grid is, you tell the system not to turn on. So you've got all that hot water, doesn't use any energy, keeps your energy bill down. And then the second the peak load is done and your rates go back down, you, the system will automatically start reheating your water throughout the rest of the night. The load shifting, you can check more out about that at nrdc.org, but these systems do that. I'll be testing it out on mine this summer. I also wanna thank our second tier sponsor, Rockwool, who's making, um, uh, stonewall insulation for all over the home, uh, all aspects uh, of the home from top to bottom to help keep heat in and do it in a more sustainable way. So we're super thankful for their support. Um, and so before we get into the session, again, how does these products fit into LEED certification? So first, we've got the min minimum energy performance, um, right? So that's a given. We need to hit a certain energy efficiency standard through Energy Star Homes, Energy Star version three in our buildings. And that's derived by the HERS index rating. So that's that home energy rating, 100 being sort of a built to code, zero being a net zero home. Uh, when you have foundation insulation in certain types with a certain R values, it can drive your HERS index rating even lower to improve performance. So that's very important. And so you can pick up additional lead points by doing that. You can also use something called the lead energy budget to get a, a, a points as well. And so that's another place to look if you're using this type of insulation. Here's your lead reference standard on the left and here is as designed on the right. Again, you can drive down that energy use and that performance uh, with these types of products with Stonewall uh, being placed uh, in the foundation or under the slab. This is all required within the Energy Star program, depending on the type of build you have, whether you're a slab on grade, or whether you've uh, got a basement or a crawl space, reference that Energy Star program, which is required for LEED, and it's gonna tell you what you need to do based on your build type, and then what you need to do based on uh, your climate zone. So those are all listed in the Energy Star checklist. You can check those out for free. We have them listed, and your energy rater should know more about that. 
Now, besides energy conservation, uh, foundation insulation and foundations have a lot to do with durability. And so in the dur um, for durability management, you have to follow the Energy Star Water Management Program. And so you can see class one vapor retarder not installed on the interior side of air permeable insulation on an exterior below grade wall has a direct correlation with the types of insulations we're gonna be talking about today. So that's gonna have an impact there in your water management system. And then also, what are the materials made out of? Environmentally preferable products get you points for having um, better performing insulation as far as um, uh, post-consumer or pre-consumer recycled content. So these types of products, again, are going to meet these requirements by having these higher levels of post or pre-consumer uh, that we're gonna talk a little bit about more that can get you points and lead. And then finally, lead innovation really wants to drive transparency in all the products we put in our home. Uh, and so looking at their, uh, their innovative um, credit here that you can use for homes and other applications, uh, option one, there are many different aspects to this, so you gotta go check it out. But option one looks at environmental product declarations and having a certain amount of your products come from manufacturers with EB, EB, uh, EPDs is very important to drive transparency. Where are these materials coming from? Where are they going? How are they operating in the building? What is their embodied energy or carbon footprint? These are very important questions. And so products like Stonewall, uh, certain ones might have these EBDs and you can use them to gain more points and build transparency. So I wanna turn it over to really talk about the, tech, uh, the technologies, the ideas, the product here. So I'm excited to have um, uh, Dan Elderman. He's been in the built environment for 20 plus years, beginning as a project manager of large commercial projects and is now working primarily with res residential designers, builders, and contractors. He's been with Rockwell for almost 10 years and works with builders, contractors, architects nationwide um, through high performance home and systems. And then we've also got um, Chris uh, Lemur Giddens and is, uh, is with his wife Jody of LG Squared in Atlanta, Georgia. They take seriously that a home is perhaps the biggest investment in anyone that makes in their lifetime. They believe every home should it, uh, last for a very long time and be as comfortable, efficient, durable, and as resilient as the day it was completed. Um, they believe that a home's beauty is more important than its performance. Um, so we wanna welcome Chris and Dan uh, here. And at this point, Dan, I will hand it off to you and you can please take it away. All right, well, thank you, Brett. Thanks, Brett. And then I'm just gonna need to share my screen. There it goes. All right. All right, so you should be able to see my screen at this point. Is that correct? I see it, Dan. I, yes. Right. Thank you, Chris. So yeah, so welcome. Uh, you know, so I guess Brett already kind of did all of our introductions for us. So I think we'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, typically, the way that that me and Chris kind of work, it, this is going to be more of a discussion based. Me being part of a manufacturer, Chris being a designer and a builder himself. So. I think we kind of hit all the all the different notes around, you know, both the process, you know, recommended install practices uh, from historical uh, projects that Chris actually worked on himself. And so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So I'm I'm with Rockwell Insulation, the the global leader of uh, Stonewall Insulation, dating back to about 1937. So this is actually our sustainability report. Uh, which is now on our, available on our website. It's about a 50-page document, and it really just tells you. And again, what Chris was or what uh, Brett was saying about you know transparency. That's one thing that we really pride ourselves in with Rockwell. So you could go on there, download the report, uh, and you could look at all the things that we're kind of working on uh, in terms of you know embodied energy and all these other things. So we are a natural renewable resource. Uh, basalt is the most abundant resource in the world. It does our products don't off gas into the environment. There's also zero waste to landfill at our plants in North America. Uh, the water from our production is actually collected and reused. 
in the production, we could actually cut our material with the water collected uh, because our product is hydrophobic. Uh, we also, in our, in our Canadian plants, we do recycle the heat there and use that for heating in, in the plants themselves. Uh, we save 100 times the amount of energy used to produce the product, and that's a 50-year span. Uh, we are now pulling product out of uh, Danish buildings that had been in there installed for about 55 years with the same, if not better, R value than the day that it was installed. We also have 16 to 40 percent recycled content. There is more if, if needed for a particular project. We are also GreenGuard Gold certified and then STG negative as well. And this is something, you know, you, you might see, and again, going back to the EPDs, you know, if you look at the rock or the stone wool uh, kind of category, and that's going to be the NEMA, that's going to be what you see. Uh, rock wool is actually less than that. And if you look at some of our competitor products, you know, they're going to be the ones that are raising that NEMA uh, standard. So all this information is available on our website as well. Uh, and we also have declare labels and other EPD reports. So today we're going to be going over, you know, foundation types and insulations used for those found for foundations. Uh, and then also energy efficient solutions. You know, I consider the, the foundation, the home's heat sink. It's just in the in the ground, in the earth. The only area that really you get that kind of radiator effect uh, with the with the foundation and concrete being only an R1 per foot, you know that's an area that really uh, needs a lot of that insulation. And then we're also going to look at some problem areas and different solutions. And then we're going to open it up and do Q and A as well. So the building envelope and Chris, I know you know I'm going to bring you in right now. Uh, you know. Where is the heat loss? You know, when we start talking about foundations. Yeah, uh, found, you know, foundations uh, are, well, they're, we're most of the time are made of concrete and we've got concrete and steel are probably the, are the two biggest uh, thermally conductive materials that we build with. So we're gonna see a lot of heat loss in anything above grade because below grade we get conditions you know our temperatures below are depending on where you are they start around 60 degrees and start dropping from there but so the deeper you go the less heat loss you have with with concrete and steel but uh, especially slabs on grade uh, those are that's probably one of the biggest culprits of heat loss in a home next to windows and any other and air leakage and and things like that so you know, we this is where we have a huge opportunity to control our heat loss in a building is through through our foundation and that transition between the foundation and the uh, the framing above because those are two different materials and that's where we have a joint and so we have to control that with air sealing and uh, thermal control layers and and that so yeah this is a huge uh, opportunity. Yeah, and I mean, so for both remodeling and also new construction, I find that, you know, if you have an existing home, there are ways to insulate properly. And this is a very extreme way. This was actually, I believe this was Alan Benoit up in, uh, up in Vermont with uh, sustainable design, but they were doing a new foundation on that project there. Mm -hmm. So there's different foundation types, and Chris alluded to the slab on grade foundation which I know he likes the most, especially since he does personally does not like going into crawl spaces, nor do I, nor Ew. do many people. <laughs> um, and Man-eating spiders, Dan. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> and then we're going to talk about basements and then the other critical areas. And, you know, we talk about rim joists and sill plates, which might even be more air leakage in that area than the entire concrete, you know, if you're doing a basement or crawl space more than concrete just in that one little area so I, I think i think just something to point out there dan is that if you go back to that detail there's a um there's so much going on there and you're dealing with uh, a thing that many people should know and that's um, your uh, design and execution of control layers and here you have uh the you have you have um, water air moisture and heat and 
in in this and here you've got a, a lot of things going on that but but there is a continuity of all these control layers where the foundation meets the floor where it meets the wall and this is a huge a huge thing to keep in mind that we can't just throw insulation on a building extra insulation and have that lead to a high performance building or, or a certified building this this is just one of the pieces and if you don't address all give all equal weight and make sure they all connect and stay connected and robust and durable for the life of the building you are going to have failures and you're just back to where we were before uh, these programs and building science and all this talk began so yeah just, and that's and that's similar to every system in your home i mean it's like installing a boiler or a furnace but not having any duct work Yep. So they all need to rely on one another, the thermal, the air, the water control layers. Yeah. For those of you who haven't heard it, there's this, uh, there's a phrase that we use. Um, uh, it's called house is, the house is a system. And I like to equate that to like your, the, all of this, your body and all of the different the organs and the circulatory systems and how everything is this network that works together and the house works exactly the same way from the materials to the systems and everything in between and it all needs it all is dependent on the other and it's just so critical to make sure you're thinking holistically and uh you know so yeah yep and then you know the home's heat sink so where where is the best place to insulate and I, I find the first thing that we always need to look at is really looking at this as conditioned space or unconditioned space. And this goes from the, from the slab all the way up to the top, uh, to the attic. So do you wanna keep it conditioned or unconditioned? And I think in the perfect world, just doing all continuous insulation, and Chris has worked on a couple projects that it's all just continuous on the exterior, and he'll actually be going through that project in a little bit. Uh, but, you know, how how can you? And sometimes, you know, the budget isn't there to to dig up the foundation or lift your house up and re-insulate. And one nice thing about Vapor Open products is you could really put it anywhere that you want in that home and you're not going to be worried about or you don't need to worry about, you know, uh, putting up a vapor barrier in a place that you're not going to be, you know, hurting the, the home's foundation in, in the long run. And then Chris, this was your your design on the bottom right and the top right. So if you want to talk about slab on grade, yeah. As I mentioned before, you know slabs are a very um, uh, they, there's 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 a lot of debate throughout the, the the world about whether slab on grade is the most efficient. And I'm worried about you know all of my utilities under there. What if something happens to the plumbing and I have to, you know, bust up the slab? Yeah, well, all of that is still a concern. And, but the, so whether, wh whatever works for your, you know, there's budget, there's practicality, there's cost. I mean, I mean, there's just so many factors that go into the design to begin with, but with a slab, you have um, there's a frost line to, to, to think about. The further north you go, the higher, the, the higher that frost line, uh, the deeper that frost line is here in the southeast. In Atlanta, our frost line is around 18 inches below grade. And so it's the upper 18 inches here that we're most concerned with. But because it's still cold below that 18 inches, we still think about it in terms of just including the entire structure of the house within our our control layer so our thermal control layer if we can if the budget allows it we 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 continue that control layer under the entire slab so this is an example in the upper right corner of a pro this is an off-grid home in uh, north carolina and the frost line there is a bit uh, deeper than 18 inches uh, but we used um we use this continuous insulation around down down the uh, turn down uh, to the to the base of the footer of the the thickened edge and that thickened edge footer uh, underneath it we had to use uh, more of a rigid um, higher uh, had had to have higher uh, bearing capacity so we use something uh, other than like a stone wool so we use stone wool down to the bottom and then just wrap the whole thing because. And what it what it did for the homeowners was we were there uh, in 
late, I think in November, December, and it had gotten down to about 30 or 40 degrees. And, and this was before we finished, but uh, close to the end. And the owners came in worried about it. They, were, they kept their shoes on. I said, no, we can take our shoes off. And they thought their slab was heated because it was so uh, different than most slabs that they had. So we controlled that heat loss. And the, the biggest heat loss in this slab is gonna be horizontal around the perimeter where you have concrete on one side and exterior on the outside. Not, not the ground, but the actual air. So when it's 15 degrees or 10 degrees uh, outside, you, you have a temperature difference, say it's if it's 70 inside of 60 degrees or more. So that heat loss is gonna be huge. So that's where our biggest control factor is. So if, if on a budget, I'm gonna just run continuous insulation to the bottom of the turndown because that's where the greatest heat loss is. Where I can save money is not underneath the slab, which you can control with, you know, interior with heating and, and cooling and that. So this is a very robust slab. This was being off grid, you have to save every penny, every ounce of heat loss that you can so that you don't have to use that, you know, the power that you're generating on site. So that's what you're looking at here, the yeah. bottom. Yeah. And pretty much also, you know, because you're insulating underneath the concrete, yep. ultimately what you're doing is your ambient temperature inside of that room is warming the floor, but then it stops there. It doesn't right. continue to go through. So as yep. long as you're keeping your home stable, uh, you know, it's just like accelerating on the highway is probably where you, you use the most energy in your car, whether that be an electric car or gasoline powered car. Uh, but you know, same thing with the house, as long as you're keeping that temperature constantly at like a 68 degrees, your slab ultimately is going to really be starting to absorb that energy and, but keeping that energy stored. And because Chris, there was ahead. a question, um, what specific insulation did you use under the turndown? Seems like the bearing capacity would need to be incredibly high as essentially the entire building is resting on it. That was a question. No, good, good. No, it's a good question. And we used a type six uh, EPS uh, expanded uh, extruded polystyrene that is has a bearing capacity that's uh, four times the bearing capacity of soil. And so it's it's we, we went beyond what we needed to because we could. It's not a it's not a large amount of of insulation. So we just went with the type type six. Uh, but it's it it's um. But our engineer has has designed our slab, and he designed it with that insulation below. And and stone wool products do not have the same bearing capacity; they're actually lower than soil, so that's why we cannot use it under there. And you know the weight is distributed uh, quite a bit. So you've got one the perimeter of the slab; that's where all the, the weight is is at the edge. But it is distributed. Uh, so it's not just a, po a single point load in one spot. So that's why it's a, we're able to use use that uh, higher density uh, insulation. And it's yeah, and this stuff. Think, this stuff's actually borate treated, so it helps with termites. Yeah, I think that same product is what they sometimes put underneath uh, roads when yeah. they're paving a road. They'll actually use recycled EPS, uh, Type Six EPS. Right. Yeah, it's oh. it's, but just one thing also to note on that detail. Sorry, Dan, I keep making yep. you go back. No problem. It's just the continuity, and you see that the insulation and the, the 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 dark gray membrane there. That's our our vapor barrier, and it connects to the the liquid applied membrane on the sheathing. And there's a termite barrier tape that connects. You know that that, that overlaps there, and it's so there's a there's all of our control layers, all four of them are continuous. Um, so essentially you have the same assembly in theory, the, the, the perfect wall, uh, if you will, the, the four control layers. So the wall is the roof is the floor. So all of them have it and they're all connected at the corners uh, with, with perfect continuity. 100% continuity is king. And when we start talking about exterior insulation, you know, I think just especially below grade, that's really where you're, like I said earlier, you know, your concrete is an R1 per foot. 
so if you could prevent that that concrete from getting cold in the first place you're not going to ha have any kind of risk of condensation if it is a basement uh, and your risk just really drops down quite a bit and as Chris was saying you know one of the more important spots to insulate because you do still have that from the footing to the to the stem wall to the slab if you simply just cut a small piece of the stone wool insulation and place it right where that red box is you know that's also breaking your thermal bridge from the exterior to the interior and effectively this design also is going to be uh uh thermal bridge free the the and other that, advantage to this dan is that uh the expansion and contraction that's natural not because of temperature but because of drying out you know uh, of concrete is that this this allows and the thermal expansion as well but this allows the the slab to move and i've had every house we've done this on they've experienced fewer cracks in their slab than one that's poured right up to the slab to the basement wall so it's a it you know it serves obviously more than one purpose and it's more temperature stable too so it's not mm -hmm. going through that expansion contraction nearly as much right. as a traditional slab yeah and then, but also at the same time, you're remodeling, you want to, you know, insulate on the inside using vapor open products. I think also, you know, stonewall is hydrophobic, so it's not going to wick water. It's going to, it's molded, mildew resistant. And there's many different ways to still have your continuous barrier on the interior and then go to the exterior like you see. And again, there's a lot of focus on that transition there for air sealing and keeping the thermal layers all continuous. But then when we let's dive a little deeper into different foundation insulation products that are out on the market and we talked a little about the EPS uh, you know that's going to be an R 3.8 per inch there's no off gassing because there are no blowing agents in EPS uh, you know detailed cutting may be pretty difficult it could be messy typically it's like a like a snowstorm when you're when you're cutting it especially on like a on a table saw and the perm rating, you know, that's something else to always look at when you're looking at insulation products is what the perm permeability rating is. And that's going to range from about 3.4 to 0.4. So anything under one is a truly is a vapor barrier or a class one vapor barrier. Uh, then when we look at XPS, you have R5 per inch. It's going to off gas about 10%. Uh, reduction in R value in anywhere from two to 20 years. This is on, I think, every single board of their insulation. It says that. Uh, there is no bounce back, so if you do over compress a fastener or something, it's going to crack. Uh, it's lightweight, you know. That's something that I think I used to, you know, when I was doing these commercial projects, I remember pushing a whole pallet of it myself, uh, and that was just 10 years of playing soccer, really. Uh, the perm rating is 0.9 to 0.1, and that's really once you get over an inch, it's going to be a vapor barrier. Uh, and especially when you start looking at northern climates and again talking more wall systems you put that outside you don't put enough insulation on the outside and now your vapor drive is moving out and it's essentially a vapor barrier on the wrong side of the wall system and then you have polyiso which that's the one with the a lot of them have foil facers or paper facers that's 5.5 to 6 per inch off gas is up to 20 percent reduction of r value uh and it's very sensitive to ultraviolet light as well and perm rating for that is about two to, to 0.1 and these are all perm ratings from rdh dan i have just two things to say about that one that the 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 poly iso reduction is happens as the temperatures drop which is sort of you know opposite of what you want to have happen so when it gets as as you as your temperature goes uh, dips your r value uh, decreases so that's but not a, not a, and in fact I think stone wool is sort of the opposite in some cases that it actually increases when, it doesn't increase as much as that decreases mm -hmm. but it's it just still has that um, the other thing is that the perm rating you it's okay to have a, a vapor barrier in your assembly if you if it's if it's correct if it's if it, right. if, it, if it is okay you have to know that ahead of time there are, and you might be going, we might be going into this a little bit later about the hydrothermic analysis or, and blah, blah, blah. I'll let you talk about that. But it's, it's a, 
it's okay if the if the if the hydrothermics are okay you can have it it's just just to make that point that you 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 know stressing that hey you got to be careful you do you don't want to put it in there and trap moisture and that's a that's the big big deal mm -hmm. yeah you need to design for it properly yep. and the other thing with remodels a lot of times you don't know that entire system so you know you want to make sure that the system is is right for the for the entire thing right. so when we when we talk about stone wool and this is the eight pound density board and actually for mostly the only difference is going to be the r value per inch the eight pound density board uh, is going to be a 4.2 per inch whereas the the 11 pound board is still a four per inch for that uh, so first and foremost, termite resistant. I mean, the product, it's made out of rock. So termites do not like ingesting it. We did do full testing out in Hawaii with uh, 400 Firmicin termites and they found it. They don't, they don't want to mess with the stuff. Uh, it's also quick draining and it just, you know, especially in a horizontal, like up against a foundation, water is probably going to get into it, but it's going to drain right out very quickly. Uh, zero off-gassing, no blowing agents used. It's also uh, dimensionally stable and uh, vapor open. It's very easy to cut. And I have a video uh, of somebody actually scribing an old stone foundation and fitting it right in there very nicely. That was uh, Travis Brungart of uh, Catalyst Construction. It's so and easy to cut, Dan, that I, mistake, I mistook it for bread and I tried to eat that for lunch. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> Big mistake. Oh yeah, my belly was my belly was complaining for weeks. <laughs> Go. Um, and then lower embodied carbon, then foam. Uh, so again, you could compare our EPD with the with the foam manufacturers. And then I always say back where it all started. It's it's from the ground. You're putting it back into the ground, so it's benign. It's not going to leach into any groundwater, or I mean, it's rock. So typically even allergens and whatnot, it's just a, it's, it's a natural product. Uh, we, st we, Dan, we use that and I know we talk about it. We stick it in the ground a lot and we get a lot of questions about whether it's, it's good to expose it to moisture. But if you're, if you have proper drainage of your site, you're not going to have moisture building up inside unless you have water table issues and that's a whole nother design thing to know about, right. but it's something we do constantly and we've had, and, and it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we are ICCES uh, certified applications. So you could see we do insulated sheathing, uh, perimeter foundation, concrete slab, uh, residential cathedral ceilings, even slow, low sloped roof systems, uh, and also root, flat roof systems. We have some products for that as well. And then Chris, uh, as a designer and builder, you know, why do you design with and build with stone wool? So we, you know, our, our, we came into this industry as architects. Uh, well, as a, I'm a builder's son, but my, but then my training was architecture. And then I got into um, hardcore building science and designing mechanical systems. And, and so, you know, knowing what I know about and, and then consulting around uh, around the U.S. and and abroad about how to have how to, how to make enclosures work better, and then understanding the problems and what causes these failures, you know, and then getting into construction and wanting to make sure that we are selecting uh, and building with something that's going to last, that's going to be comfortable, durable, efficient, you know, and help with the efficiency of the building, and help the building be there for generations and when you're going through your selection of any material you have a, you have a checklist that says I want I want this product material to do all of these things and when you think of insulation you know insulation came back in the early 1900s and then then they generated the vapor barrier and then we had these issues of you know, trapping moisture. Well, moisture. So moisture is an issue. We have air. We have air movement. We have uh, obviously thermal bridging uh, here in the southeast and and other parts of the world. You have lots of you have termites. You have other critters and that will embed themselves into insulation. They'll eat the insulation. They'll and so you and then when you're installing it, especially on the exterior, you have exposure 
uh, until you put the cladding on or you have open joint cladding so the, the insulation continues to be exposed. Uh, again, durability, something that's going to last a really long time. Well, what's been around forever? How about rocks? And so, uh, and then just being able to um, put this in it, because I, I found over the, through all of it that what we, we did our own little tiny house a few years ago and, and we were responsible for installing our bat insulation. And not only I mean, it, we used we used stone wool and there weren't issues of comfort, you know, like, oh, it was itchy. I didn't get any of that. But it was more of trying to get it perfect because I'm really anal about that. And we should be. We should we need to make sure we're installing it per recommendation and per manufacturer's instructions and and to make it to make it effective. Otherwise, it's it's it might not might, might as well not put it in. So when I was doing this myself, uh, and putting those expectations on me, I said, this is, it is so much easier to put, just stack these boards, two foot by four foot or four foot by eight foot on the outside and bonus, it's the best place for insulation. It protects the structure forever, expansion and contraction. So all of these things combined with thinking about, and then building a house, uh, this off grid project up in the mountains of North Carolina, where they're prone to forest fires. So what, what is it, you know, that whole assembly was made with uh, metal, uh, steel framing, gypsum sheathing, and stone insulation, and then metal cladding. So there was no wood in that structure because the owner really wanted this thing to not burn to the ground or, or even be compromised. And so thinking about all of those things that, that when you're selecting a product, and particularly an insulation, this checked off all those all of our concerns and they're listed here these seven seven things that that at a minimum these are these are the sort of the primary ones and it just it addressed every single one of them and it just made so much sense to um, use a product that a material that can just take care of everything that we want and, and it's just as thermal thermally resistant as just about any other insulation out there sometimes more so it it, it just it did everything that we needed it to do we figured out how to do it effectively, cost effectively on the exterior, and it just it it wins all all the way through. So it's just it's it's the right for what we're trying to achieve and what our owners expect and are investing in this this thing that's their biggest investment ever, and they want it to be good. This this does so much for us. Yeah, and for, so for the next couple slides, Chris, I'm gonna you know show you some of the testing data that we've we've done on our own. So you know we've seen that it's you know termite resistant in the field, but getting that actual test, this was probably about two or three years ago that we did this again out in Hawaii, and you could see I like to look at that weight loss percentage, and if you look at that, you could see the weight loss percentage that was after being locked up in a in a case basically with these termites and the stone will only lost 1.22 percent and if you look at pressure treated lumber that's 4.85 percent so it's actually about four times less prone to termites than even pressure treated lumber uh, and then of course untreated lumber is 51 percent and again that's only 28 days a lot of times you're building houses that are going to last for more than 28 days right chris um I go 29. I usually give 29. it 29 and then start to see decay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, and then the next one, you know, stable R values. I think this is also a big one. And I brought up off gassing before. Uh, and this is just showing basically what happens. What happens is you have these bubbles and they put a different kind of gas inside of them with the foam products. And what happens over time is those bubbles break down and then the gas that they put in releases and it gets refilled with air. So that's why you do see that reduction of R value. Uh, polyiso having about 20% there and then 10%. And also, you know, when you look at another part of the equation is the temperature driven uh, R value as well. And stone wool will actually go up about 10 to 20%, whereas, you know, a polyiso could drop 20% right there. Um. Dan, you had mentioned some of these were internal studies or or not. There were some questions here about folks 
wanting to learn more just about um, off-gassing in general, do you, are these your studies or are there good studies you can point to people to? Um, we have a lot of these through RDH. That's one of the, the la research labs that we use. We do all third-party testing, not our own. Uh, and all the in all of it should be on our product document documentation page on our website. Thanks. So yeah, but if anybody needs those, I could I could definitely send you the the link. Uh, so by all means, just just reach out to myself. And then dimensional stability, and I always love this picture. You know, I know Chris, you don't get much in the way of snow, but this is such an easy way to look at you know, both shrinkage and also thermal bridging all in one shot. Are you shot. kidding, Dan? We get two inches sometimes. Of ice. <laughs> of, yeah. I mean, that, Solid ice. Yeah. I'd like to see you match that. <laughs> we had three feet of snow this, this winter oh. in Pennsylvania. And yeah, <laughs> that was too much for me. So this, uh, I apologize, this is an, a very old slide. Uh, so I think that this was actually produced on a typewriter at first, but, uh, but you can see, you know, what happens with stone wool, because one of our biggest questions is always what happens when it gets wet. And the quick answer is actually by the time that the product drains, it's already dry before you can almost test for a lot of this information, because a lot of these testings, they do it for two or three days of testing for the R value. And by then, actually, the stone wool is, is dry. Uh, but what they did, they actually saturated with 90% relative humidity, and they used uh, one of our, our medium density products. And at 0 0.01 pounds per cubic foot, uh, the, the R value basically didn't really even change. Whereas what they found, though, because they super saturated the product, is it could handle 3.1 pounds per cubic foot before our values start to even decline. So it's even more than they could physically get into the product uh, naturally that you're not gonna have any issues with that kind of uh, temperature loss or our value loss. And this is actually just by uh, how much water content we actually kind of injected into the product and the thermal conductivity that we saw. And kind of see how that and again i think there's in the handout section you could actually download all this as well uh, when we look at exposure you know ultraviolet light now we do recommend uh covering it over and within six months and but this was a project that it was a montreal hospital and it was just left exposed because they were adding on an addition they don't want to have to reclad it then two years went by and they were going to have to rip off that cladding and then put it back up. So for this one, we actually did some monitoring and we found that even after two years of being exposed, there is no loss of R value and no product degradation either. Well, and then Chris, was, that's, yeah. that's a beautiful okay. picture there. I was just going to bring that up that there were when we were posting pictures about this, we had a lot of people say, boy, it's too bad you have to cover that up because that's beautiful. You know, that's a nice it's a nice pattern. It's it was very well uh, neatly installed. But yes, this is our uh, high performance uh, project in Marietta, just just north of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, that's uh, four inches of stone wool there on the walls and seven inches on the roof there. and uh, so yeah, we did. This is uh, that detail that we showed earlier is based on is was was for this particular this project, uh, and you've, we're used instead of the uh, EPS which you see on the right, uh, we used XPS which is ext uh, extruded. EPS is expanded. Excuse me, I think I misspoke earlier. But the extruded polystyrene is is uh, uh, on the on the left there um and it's uh yeah, yeah so anyway that's that's the same it's type six and we only as you can see there we only took the insulation two feet in past the the turn down and that's because of budget and because we're in georgia and we have our you know our soils are 55 to 60 degrees uh and our frost line is around 18 inches we that's that is adequate that's very that's way more than most do 
uh, we did have to do some education to our building inspector because he thought we were breaking breaking the code. But uh, yeah, so this is um, same same kind of detail, just a big turn down at the edge, and we do have to do the form work like that, you know, kind of to to create that solid straight edge for our insulation because the insulation itself doesn't work as as the form work. So this is uh, this is all getting the prep. We pack that gravel really well before we set down our our insulation, our type X or type six, and uh, and then we uh, and then we sort of put these little little uh, uh, purlins in there to help stabilize, uh, and then we'll fill up the 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 well there to the left. We'll fill that up with gravel, and then lay our insulation on top of that. And you see, it's in two layers. And this is a higher density. Uh, you can easily use uh, the lower density uh, products like a um, that of stone wool under the slab because you're not again, like I said earlier, we're not doing a point load on this stuff, so it's 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 distributed, and our slabs are fully reinforced with uh, number four rebar at at least 16 inches on center, and so we're you know the slab does a lot of the work and it distributes that so here's here's what it looks like the the upper two pictures in the upper left there are of the marietta project where we stopped the insulation two feet in and then the bottom left and the one on the right is from the off-grid project where we took that four inches all the way across uh under the under the slab so how much how much insulation would you say is enough for below a slab? I know at our last webinar uh, that we had, you brought up about the fact that even putting an inch is better than none at all. Correct. Yeah, when you're dealing with a slab, any any heat lo uh, heat loss control that you have, a reduction that you can get is is going to help because that's there's so so much happens right there at that edge. Uh, and, and so much heat loss. We lived we lived in a condo that had a you know it was a post tension slab and they had balconies, just you know with no thermal break there and it was always just an icicle you know around that that right next to the balcony there, and so anything you can do one inch would just you know and all and and if, if that's all you do on the outside of the building just to protect your to protect you from that heat loss, do it. It's mm -hmm. not it's not a big it's not a big uh, a big ad. Well, and I think the way you explained it last time was even talking about a koozie. Yeah, exactly. Because that you know here in the south we're known for our sweating glasses, and if you <laughs> you know, and then the idea the reason that's happening is you've got that heat loss, and where that when when the temperature on the surface of that glass reaches dew point, that's the condensation, and when you put that koozie on there, you're slowing that down, and that's a very thin layer that, that koozie is and so if you put just a even a koozie thick thick layer uh, around your house you're going to slow it down mm -hmm. um chris there is a question uh, specific to the eps were you talking type 9 or type 11 type 6 type 6 is all you need i mean type 6 is actually way beyond what you need type uh i believe type 4 is um trying to think of, of the pressures you could go even below type four and still meet the same bearing capacity of soil so type six was a belt and suspenders because we could the budget was there and it's not you're not talking about a, a huge increase in cost so go for it it's it's there just in you know uh, again belt and suspenders yeah i think there was a little confusion on the actual slide it said 11 i want to say had an x oh, that's high two isn't it yeah. Oh, I see. Yep. Type six, yes, yeah, should be VI. Yeah, my bad. Yep. No, no, that's not a problem. And then, what's the next step after you put the rock wool, or I'm sorry, the stone wool up? Yeah. So we'll. Um, you you need to have your vapor barrier, and the vapor barrier always goes on direct in direct contact with your slab. Uh, in in the in the off grid project, we used a 15 mil. Uh, this was before we they uh, came out with a termite proof vapor barrier so this this is uh and we so we ended up um, using that that termite proof one in the marietta project and that's the black one on the lower left and so this is you know and it's got to be taped and sealed 
perfectly because that's where the the termites and and that can get in and so we've once we did that we also i mean we also sealed around those same penetrations uh after the slab was poured with a liquid flashing so we've you know we really paid attention to our details and it you know this is a little tedious if to do it correctly you can see on the in the picture on the right you know he's making sure it follows the formwork and not just laying it down and letting the slab do or the, the concrete pour do the work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and this is one of the few places i think you know ground gas i think is also a big one uh sure. with radon and other you know issues depending where you are in the country yeah. Yeah, and we use a we use a radon mitigation system that's just a horizontal pipe in the gravel that connects to a vertical pipe that goes through the roof, and then it's sometimes assisted with a with a fan to help move that radon. But we have to do that here in the south. Did you find that with radon mitigation, it was actually I don't know if easier or what's the what's the terminology, but because stone wool is vapor permeable, you're able to kind of pull more through it i think yeah i don't think it's permeable enough to to for for right. you know the, you need to kind of give it a, a a real um a real path and i think the the best way to do that is the through gravel. this the the venting system that's connected to the gravel which is you know yeah it's pretty coarse gravel mm -hmm. uh so so that's really you know to get especially in the areas of the country where you have a lot of radon like colorado and some parts of the south and so you you need to make sure you uh, have um, you know something that's sure to do it because because right. rockwell does have i mean it's air permeable but it still resists air movement you know right. it's, it's good yeah. it's good at that so you want to make sure you're not r restricting that movement of, of yeah the gases. yeah and with all the cross-directional fibers and everything you're not able to right. like blow on one side of the of right. the piece and feel it on the other Correct. Um, so anyway, like I oh, said, sorry. super re no super reinforced. Just you know, uh, I don't trust a lot of the welded wire fabric. They put them on chairs, but if that then sometimes that works. But a lot of times they won't put the chairs under there, and then they squash it, and it just stays at the bottom of the slab. So we we do this, and, and this helps with the durability, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. long term. So. And then protecting the slab is something, uh, this is actually a, a non-perforated membrane that we use to help protect, because these were gonna be finished, these are finished floors. We're not putting wood over or anything over them. And so we're gonna polish them later. And so this is a, a something we use all the time. It's, it's a way to protect the floor, whether it's wood you know, sh sheathing or it's, it's the concrete, but it also being non-perforated, it holds the moisture in the slab a lot longer and helps it helps the slab cure longer. So this is a, an, mm -hmm. an extra benefit of that. So, and that's that's what structural engineers love it when we use this because it helps helps us really get a durable slab. Yeah. Uh, so as I said earlier, concrete and metal are the two most conductive materials you we build with, and if you ever if, if we ever build with uh, steel framing like we did on the off-grid project, we will we would never ever do it without knowing we're doing exterior insulation. This stuff will you will lose so much heat through metal, and if you if you just put the cavity insulation in there, you are going you it's 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 a uh, uh, well from a performance perspective, it's a mistake. So this this had this project had six inches of exterior uh, on the walls and eight inches on the roof. Yeah, I think if you just did the cavity insulation and it looks like two by four, uh, you're probably looking at it at a nominal R value of about an R15, but an effective R value of probably like an R2. <laughs> yeah, it's R3. very low. It's very so, very low yeah. because it's just so it's just. It's a super yeah. highway for heat, man. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and and these guys were complaining just because they were building it in a cold part of the year when when they started, and so they were wearing their thicker gloves. Uh, how cold is cold is, though? Hey, this is Western North Carolina, so it got below oh, okay. forty. It got oh wow. Below 40. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I think we saw some teens up there one time and got more than two inches of snow. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, that's even like uh, when you start talking about thermal bridging, even I noticed this winter, I, I yeah. bike all through the year and uh -huh. I have a product called their bar mitts and they go over your handlebars. But I found I actually had to yeah. double wrap my my handlebars. So because oh my, my handlebars are metal, yeah, they were so. <laughs> even in these things, they'd still uh -huh. get cold. So I double wrapped them, increased yeah. the insulation on them, and they actually worked a lot better this year. It's yeah, it's a wicked, so. it's a it's a wicked uh, thing. But you you, but it certainly makes for a really durable structure. And if you can, as long as you wrap it in, uh, this is a great example of that kind of thing where you, uh, the, the 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 idea of wearing a coat. You know, when mm -hmm. you wear, you don't, well, one of us in the industry says, don't swallow your sweater. So you wouldn't swallow your sweater to put the insulation in between your ribs. You would wear your sweater on the outside. So mm -hmm. this is a really good example of why that's super critical. Well, and similar with foundation systems yeah. and getting that to right. the exterior is definitely best practice. Yeah, correct. And then when we look at, you know, air leakage prone areas, you know, you look at the sill plate and you look at that kind of area. And here's some some tips. Uh, this was actually from Stephen Basic. Uh, using acoustical sealant on the sill uh, gasket material just to kind of increase there. You know, you could just tape the exterior like this, and that's also going to stop that air air leakage point. Do you have a picture of one of ours? I don't. Well, we use a we use a rubber gas an EPDM gasket underneath the bottom sill. Uh, but the main thing on this uh, with when you're trying to air seal here, do it on the outside where the wall meets the foundation because that's where you're going to get the best control of air. So trying to do it under the sill where the weight of the building continues to to bear down on that sealant. It's going to keep squashing it and those and those sill gaskets that blue sill gasket there it is shown it breaks down over time and you lose mm -hmm. some of that air sealing so don't rely on that and just put everything to the outside no matter what we're talking about not just the sill but if you get it to the outside and just have that continuous and connected to the air barrier above and below then you're you're golden you can put whatever you want basically as long as you're but it's there to control moisture is that is the get the gasket yeah and then also rim joists you know air sealing you you could do something similar to this and then simply cut a uh, rigid uh board product uh stone wool board or foam board uh obviously stone wool would work great for this application and then you just finish it with a, a bat product as well and that's really you know the easy way of doing that detail, especially if you have more of an existing basement or crawl space that you want to uh, retrofit. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is just, we do have uh, a lot of, you know, information on install details. We have a 92 page uh, comfort board uh, design guide that you could actually download from our website. I try to limit printed copies, just it's a lot of paper. Uh, but if that's something that that interests you, just reach out to myself and we could get that taken care of. But these are just some of the details when you're transitioning from below grade to above grade. And Chris, what do you do in this area? But below grade, would we we run we run the uh, stone wool just down to well, if it's a basement, we'll run it to the footer like this. Mm -hmm. If it's a slab, we obviously run it to the bottom. And we have started to, there have been concerns through throughout, and we're always just saying it's not, it's not, shouldn't be a concern, but we'll use a dimple mat sometimes if there's, mm -hmm. if we have water table concerns, you know, we don't necessarily know if the water table will ever reach the, the slab or the foundation. So we will put a dimple mat to the exterior of the, of the, the insulation to help mm -hmm. prevent it from being waterlogged. Because yeah, I mean it'll it'll eventually dry out, but if the water table stays there for a while, then you're you are effectively um, having an impact on the R value. And then how about above grade? When you how do you finish that typically? So we yeah we'll do something like you see in the upper left hand corner. We use like a uh, we use me metal flashing material. Base it's a it's a, a four, uh, 24 gauge aluminum. 
And we use it also, uh, this goes back to one of the earlier slides, but we use it to protect the top of the insulation. So when we've poured our slab and then insulated to the outside so we can backfill, the top edge of that is exposed while we're framing the building because we can't continue to insulate until the framing's done. Mm -hmm. So we will run a Z flashing over the top of that, uh, that, that insulation to protect it. And then we'll tie in another piece of that same flashing to cover the exposed insulation. We'll go down, uh, you know, we probably, it's like a 14 inch piece and six inches of it is exposed. That's per the siding manufacturer. We need to have six inches from mm -hmm. siding to grade. And so we'll have eight inches below grade. This is aluminum and it's Kynar painted. So we're not worried about corrosion and it's, it just becomes a piece of trim. So we're using something functional and making it aesthetic. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Cause that's one of the questions I probably get hit the most with is how do you finish it? Mm -hmm. Um, and you then can here's also just do some kind of stucco or parge coat or anything, but the that that metal is going to be more durable. The parge coat can be kicked and you know cracked and you know, it's susceptible. Yeah, I mean, I I always think about when I was a kid and I'd be kicking the soccer ball up against the side of the house, knocking off yeah. all my dad's cedar shingles that he yeah. wasn't too happy of. But again, underneath, if there's stucco or something and it's somewhat flexible, you could crack that as well. Correct. Correct. Um, so then, you know, some of the links, tools, and support that you have through Rockwool, uh, we do have a lot of cladding attachment system videos and, and guides. We also have the CAD details that you saw throughout this presentation that we have for both uh, steel and wood frame, and both heavy cladding, heavyweight cladding, and also lightweight cladding. We do a vapor diffusion guide that we have. We have some builder guides as well, a lot of videos. Uh, definitely check out Chris's uh, YouTube channel as well. I think that's a great uh, area for you know learning how he's doing some of the things he's doing with Rockwool. Uh, we also have a lead uh, uh, V4 solutions guide. So that's also very interactive. We do have a couple lead platinum homes that have been built. So I think that's also, uh, it's, you know, again, it's insulating and air being airtight for that lead but also things like being made out of a natural product also helps. Um, and then building science, and this is, you know, now we don't really, Woofy doesn't do anything for below grade, uh, but this is all above grade, you know, wood frame, steel stud, whatever you're working on, but we do thermal bridge analysis, we do hydrothermal modeling, R value calculations, full building modeling, uh, and we also have building science seminars on high performance building as well, like this one that we're doing today. And, you know, I think also just, you know, connecting yourselves with, with somebody like me and I could really help you with the design and getting it right for your, for your climate zone as well. And that's pretty much all that kind of we, me and Chris had. Well, Chris, I don't know, is that all that you had? That I think is your detail. No, there's so much we could talk about, but that's good. Good for now. Let's, yeah. Let's see what the see what questions we have. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, we uh, have a lot of questions coming. A lot of great conversation. This has been some of the most conversation I've seen in a while. So it's it's fantastic. We're not going to be able to get to it all. Um, but we're going to try or we'll stick around and have a good conversation. Before we get to it, for those of you who are concerned, your continuing ed certificate will be emailed to you an hour after this event. Please take that survey within the certificate or when you close out, you can take that uh, survey as well. Even if you don't need CUs, let us know how we did. Give us your feedback, what you think. Um, definitely want to hear from you. For those of you watching this in the future on demand, not right now, to get your Con Ed, take that quiz with an 80% passing rate. You can follow it to our Thinkific channel or whatever channel you're watching this on and um, get onto the quiz platform and take it. And a huge thanks to our top tier sponsors, um, Mitsubishi, Build Equinox, and Ream, all of our board members, our volunteers, everyone who allows us to do what we do. Um, so, you know, there were some questions coming in specifically to cost, obviously, it's on everybody's mind. Uh, costs for construction are going up and up and up. Um, can you speak to whether, you know, Stonewall, you know, in general has been following sort of the 
industry construction cost spikes. Um, and on top of that, what strategies are there um, that can be used using the product? So I know, for example, some rigid insulations may be able to replace OSB, which is really pricey right now. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so I mean, pretty much rocks, they always pretty much stay pretty price, you know, the same price where whenever you're getting it. So the price is pretty stable. In the last couple of years, we have seen very small uh, price increases, but not much at all. And primarily, it's actually the transportation. And when you when you get a package of our product, and I guess I have some bag shots on both sides of me, you know, it is a larger package than what you're used to. So with only 312 bags per truck, and let's say the shipping cost goes up to, you know, goes up an extra thousand dollars, that's an additional three dollars per bag. Um, historically though we don't see that kind of fluctuation of pricing and then when you start looking at you know the industry and you lumber i mean i think everybody here knows that the lumber costs are going up uh and we've been receiving more information or more questions about going sheathingless and without osb or plywood and that's something that we're, our products are not going to give any kind of structural strength for racking so you would need to still achieve that structure from another, you know, product. And Chris, I don't know if you have any any more information on, you know, removing the plywood or OSB. Yeah, I've done it with with uh, with rigid insulation um, in the past, and we will stabilize the corners with with sheathing, and then you know uh, we'll have two two layers, a half inch or. And then we'll have so the first layer anyway. So we've we've done that. Um, it's certainly more and more most houses are being done, you know, with the sheathing. And I think whether it's code required or not, it's just a, a nice substrate for everything. So yeah, I mean, cost is you know construction costs they always go up no matter what's going on in the world. And you know, I'm we're trying to get a, a right now figure it out on our side of it as as the as the architect, the builder, and the consultant is to try to um, to be able to suggest when we recommend these things, you know, we're we're the ones saying, yeah, we recommend you spend more money, but we're also saying we're we're recommending you put more value into this because it is it does mm -hmm. have a long term value and an immediate value. So th those are, I mean, it's just a discussion about what's what's valuable, and you know, you have to. We're, we're trying to come up with a way to show that the, the continuous can be as close to the cost of bats when done perfectly. Uh, so that's something that could help the industry. Yeah, and even like I'm thinking about the air barrier, you know, without something solid to adhere that to, it's gonna be pretty difficult to get that, you know, not wavy or not, you know, it's gonna be difficult to work with. So at that point, the sheathing costs might be, might be worth it just for that, you know, high performance costs that you might be losing if your if your air barrier is just behind the continuous insulation. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of people, a few people on here, excited about the idea of Stonewall ICF. What is is it possible? Is it happening? Um, I mean, that's something that it wouldn't be something that we would manufacture. We would need an OEM you know, uh, a manufacturer of SIPs panels or, or ICF to mm -hmm. really, you know, sandwich everything together. But we could definitely supply the product. if Someone go invent it. I would say don't get excited about it and just stick to a traditional method of leaving your insulation to the one side of your structure because I, I get I get the idea. ICFs have had, they, they have their advantages. They don't. They work well in really cold climates. Um, I think they should. I I really feel that we just do it to the one side. I I mean I love the idea in practice, uh, in theory and everything. But I think we just we try to stick to our methods that have been tried and true. And that's just let's build us a normal structure, not using too many uh, innovative thing. I mean innovation is great, but the more we stick to traditional you know methods and just improving the installation and minor changes to it the more efficient we can be at the more effective it's going to be so i would say let's 
back off of things like that and just let's just concentrate on getting this this the the conventional way and improving that execution and understanding the assemblies better and getting those right um can you speak a little bit more about a lot of people are concerned about code officials understanding this either from an r value standpoint or from um, a durability standpoint under the ground um you know what strategies do you use to address that when when code officials are uh, questioning uh, you know these products so i mean on a manufacturing side we we do work with local code officials if somebody is building or you know specifying a product by all means reach out to myself again or you know rockwell in general and we'll we'll work with the code officials but chris i don't know how is how is your uh, code officials handling everything they like beer and uh, cookies um well i've done every single project we've we've built we've always had uh something we've always had discussions with building officials to explain what we're doing um our the r value of continuous insulation never says r38 because it's better than an r38 assembly so when we show them R26 of continuous insulation on a roof or some or 27.8 or whatever it is, they they say, well, you got to add 10 more insulation to that. I said, well, no, I don't mm -hmm. because if you look at my this calculation I'm doing because I use different modeling software and I can show them that the effective true R value of the assembly is better than that of an R38 filled in the cavity. So we have and the same with the slab on grade in Marietta. They said, oh, well, the code the code book shows this piece of insulation horizontal away from the building, and that's how you insulate your slab. I said, are you telling me then that I can't do it this way? He said, well, I've never seen that before, so I can't approve or disapprove it, so I'm going to disapprove it. I'm going to, you know, fail it for now. And so it took a couple of phone calls and getting the chief building official out to the job site. And within 10 seconds, he said, you're fine. And he walked away and said, just just approve this whole thing. So it's it's education, and if you don't know it yourself, then get people involved. Dan can help, I can help. There are people out there who can help you get to that stage where you're showing the effective R value, that it works, not only works, but it works better than the code that they're you know pushing on. And But they're just trying to cover themselves. They don't necessarily disagree with you or think that you're full of it. Uh, though I am most of the time, but they don't necessarily think that. They just cannot back it up themselves. So when it comes to court, and that's their job, they're doing their job. So when it comes to court, they're going to say, I don't know because I don't know what it is. I don't have any way to prove that it's right or wrong. Uh, I can only prove that the code says this much. So just work with, let people like us work with you, work with them. Well, and that's where even knowing the code, I think, is different than understanding the code and knowing, you know, the effective R value versus nominal R value. I think it's a great conversation and yep. education like what Green Home Institute offers with these, I think, helps. And I guess send building officials to this to, to the website. Yeah. Yeah. We have a few on here today. So uh, yeah. cool. they, uh, good. So appreciate the conversation. And, and yeah. Yeah. Um, there was some questions about, you know, water tables, water coming up, R value loss when these products get wet. Can you address that? Yeah, I mean, as you saw from the one slide, and again, you could download that and you could see like how much water it actually absorbs. But being that it's it's hydrophobic, it's going to repel moisture as soon as it kind of retains it. And so it really doesn't really absorb the moisture. But again, if it does get wet, it's what 3.1 pounds per cubic foot of water that needs to be in the product for it to actually reduce in any kind of R value. My mine is simple that if you if there is any concern of water table and you just want to be sure is just put just to just get a dimple mat in there just get a drainage plane out uh, outboard of the insulation. We've done it without the dimple mat for years and have had no water table issues. That doesn't mean that in the future, the water table doesn't rise up to the surface and create problems. But so if you want to be sure about it, which we're starting to, to get to that point, just so that 
you know, let the owners rest easy is go ahead, just put a dimple mat there and, and get it installed correctly, of course, um, but get it in there and that'll just, that will, those dimple mats are very effective at controlling water. But aside from water table, just make sure your site 100% slopes away from your building and 5% is great, is, is minimum 5% is ideal, but just get it away from the building and that'll resolve almost all of your water in your basement, in your slab, anything, just mm -hmm. drainage. Yeah, good, good, good advice there. Um, when it comes to high performance homes, you know, everybody's starting to look now towards passive house, whether it be international or US, we're not gonna necessarily get into that, but um, you know, they both certify products. Um, do you see Stonewall getting certified to, to Passive House Standard? What are some of the barriers or, you know, how do you see Stonewall um, being incorporated in the Passive House? So we've been part of many pass certified Passive Houses out there. Uh, I actually, I figure that it was mo more of a standard than a product specific kind of uh, certification. Yeah, they actually do certify products. Um, to my knowledge, they don't require that you use those certified products. It just, mm -hmm. then they can say, oh yeah, it's certified so you can, you don't have to go through additional hoops. I'm not really actually sure how it works either. So. <laughs> okay, all right. It's more, it's more like a prescription, you know, prescript, part of the prescriptive path. Like if you use these products, you're, you're more, it, it fits into it. There's no thought there. I've, cause I've run into this before it, you know, if you like, I've designed custom uh, fresh air ventilation systems and it's not quote certified as a, as a system. And so they have to evaluate it and then review it. And it got, you know, and so there's, I think that's the idea is that, okay, well, here's an offering of stuff that we've reviewed. We like it, put it in your product. You won't have to have, we won't have to look at it again. So it just helps the builders select products without having to think, oh, how do I meet that goal or how do you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it, I don't see anything that would keep this product, any of these Stonewall products from reaching that, especially the, the, the way that Rockwell does it with their, you know, efforts in the factories and sourcing mm -hmm. and uh, location. Yeah, and we could definitely yeah, look that, down that path as well. Yeah, you should look into it. So, yeah. um, there was a oh, oh that person. Well, I guess it's still a good question. Um, it, you know, is it, what was the reasoning for liking uh, XPS under the footing as opposed to EPS? <laughs> uh, there wasn't. They, they both are effective. So XPS has been known to be uh, a place, I mean, something that termites will chew into. And it's it's not the EPS that we used, it was borate treated. Uh, and so I generally I'll go with the EPS. And I think in, in now because, you know, cost is a thing and, and we can't always build that high performance lab as much as we want to. I'm tending away from that e EPS or XPS. So I don't have to even contend with the termites at all. Um, we, we treated the XPS with a, with a borate uh, spray. It's, you know, it's, um, it's called Timbor. And, but it, so I'm tending a, away from that because it's already about 30 inches below grade or 24 inches below grade. So we're below the frost line and most of the heat loss is horizontal anyway. And so I think we're, you know, we're safe in terms of thermal uh, resistance. So, but, but there's not really, I mean, they're both equally, you know, the bearing capacity is the same. So I just think it's, it's, it's whether you're comfortable with EPS or XPS below grade. And in our case, we were, you know, we were comfortable with either one. So it's, you know, yeah, that, that would be, and it's, it's on top of gravel and, 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 uh, you know, so it, yeah. no, no real magic there. Okay. Um, for people who are, uh, insulating or I guess conditioning their garages, stonewall products can be used the same way as you would in a home or are there any considerations on a garage? Same. We, we did, yeah, same. We did. We insulated the garage on the Marietta project. Uh, mm -hmm. We put two inches of continuous. 
what we did, it was a, an attached garage, so we physically separated the two buildings, but they look like they're like it's an attached garage. So the insulation actually continued around the house structure at four inches at the walls and seven inches at the roof. And then we framed it around the insulation and we got our structural engineer involved there. So we could we could do that basically just it's just a big opening in the wall. And it's just structurally as sound as if it were a solid wall. So you, you know we you can yes insulate it just the same if you're if you're going going that route. Um, yeah, it's basically a detached attached garage. You correct. treat it that way. You put the four inches or whatever your continuous insulation is, and then you could put drywall. Yeah. You know. We did two inches on the garage since it was yeah. not not that well, it's not, less delta. Yeah. Well, just because it wasn't a real living space and it was more for just right. that, you know, and the, if it ever does get below 60 degrees here, that they have some something right. warm right. to go into. <laughs> so, yeah. But, well, but and even the, around here, the, you know, yeah. you'd leave your garage door open all the time. Or yeah. I should, my wife does all the time, <laughs> I should say. She's not listening, hopefully. Shame on you, Dave. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, I have a detached garage, so it's nice, but. Yeah. You need and to... if you if you happen to air seal, of course, if you happen to air seal mm -hmm. your garage too, be sure to ventilate it, uh, especially if it's if it's attached to the house because you uh, we always have active ventilation in there, and so it's motion censored so that whenever there's any activity, door moving, person walking, it activates that fresh air ventilation, so it's pulling pulling from the house. You know, it's 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 negative pressure, so it doesn't positive pressure push it into the house okay yeah good points absolutely um you want to get that air moving in any space that you're insulating and conditioning so um some concerns or questions you know if you can just reiterate on the fact that you can't do cladding um below the grade uh on stonewall so what do you do to address that uh you can do clad. I mean, we like I said, we did the we did the the metal uh, flashing. Um, you can you can continue your furring strips below grade and do some kind of. You can extend that cladding below. We did this on uh, the the off grid house. The owners were concerned about more than just termites. They they mm -hmm. wanted to keep all the all varmints. I mean, everything mice, rats, everything out of their house. So we we had a 20 gauge uh, corrugated metal cladding on there, vertical vertically oriented, and so what we did is at basically uh, just just above grade, we put a piece of trim uh, around it to give it a base. So aesthetically, it looks like a normal house. But then right below that, we put we installed another. We continued the corrugated metal framing below grade. We used we had to treat it or uh, paint it with a marine grade paint so it stayed uh you know so to to prevent corrosion but it went down 24 inches below grade to the bottom of the footer so you can extend it down and it's it, it was attached to furring strips uh actually they were hat channels metal hat channels that were screwed into the slab edge and so you can do that and you just have to prepare the material and you just have to you know really think through that detail and make sure that everything is protected but it's definitely possible if you don't do it and leave your cladding above grade then just covering the exposed part you know six inches below so in case dirt moves over time so if you only go like one inch below you're going to end up probably exposing that so we went down eight inches below grade with our piece of trim great yeah thanks for for, for clarifying that um if you're talking about um you know insulating uh um in the walls like you would do fiberglass potentially you know somebody here is just you know chiming in saying uh that at least in their experience they had some concern with their insulator trying to fit it uh compared to fiberglass um i mean what what kind of trade-offs are there uh or is there training or some kind of techniques you need to get it right Yes. So NEMA, NEMA does have a grade one inst installation guideline on their website. Uh, it, personally, I think it's actually easier to get tighter fitting. Like you need to cut the product, you need to fit it and shape it uh, with a serrated knife, but it cuts really nicely. It's a much more dense product than fiberglass, so it's much harder to cheat with it. 
and you literally do have to cut it around all the outlet boxes. Yeah, I will uh, say we... Oh, go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead, Brett. Well, I was just going to say we don't see too many nice fiberglass installations. Uh, you know, it's usually great too if you're lucky. If you know, uh, so I think anything's better at this point, just because it's just statistically speaking, they're they're really never done right. So that's just from what we see. But yeah, that's the that's the the thing I'm I was, I'm getting to with you know you got to get to get bats perfectly. It takes time and effort. And yes, I think you know my experience with installing it in our tiny houses that we had um, the the rock the stone wool was more forgiving in you know because it was more rigid so you could but you still needed to cut it to fit correctly and you had to have some friction it had to be friction fit to some degree in order to stay in place otherwise there would be sag or movement in the cavity so there has to be some small compression but they've designed that into it and all of their R values, all of their calculations and testing is based on that compression. So you're still getting what you're paying for, but if you go too far, there is a limit, and there's that's pub, that data is published. If you go too far with the compression and everything, you will start to d diminish your R value. Yeah, and that sim same thing holds true when you start start talking about sound. Is you know any little air gap, just like thermal. If you have a little air gap, all the sound's going to go through there, just like thermal. Yep. So. Well, uh, Dan, Chris, we are at our time, but if people want to reach out to you, contact you, learn more, um, where can they do that at? So you could reach me at uh, Dan period Edelman at rockwell.com. Uh, and we could just start the conversation that way. And then Chris. Chris, uh, C-H-R-I-S, at L-G squared, Inc. So L-G-S-Q-U-A-R-E-D-I-N-C dot com. And uh, we do have some social media channels that, and, and of course our YouTube channel uh, that is is talking about all things high performance and architecture and construction and all that. So that's, that's a, at L-G squared on YouTube. And then, you know, same L-G squared, Inc. on Instagram, Facebook, and all that. Yeah. Great. Well, I, again, I uh, really appreciate you all coming out. I appreciate your time discussing this. I learned a lot and right. um, we're going to head out now, but uh, have a great rest of your week, everyone. Thank you. And we'll see you next week. So take care. All right. Thank Thanks you, so Brett. Brett. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.